Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Kat. And once again, you can probably recognise I am recording this through Zoom because I have managed to convince another one of my lovely friends to sit down and talk to me today. His name is William Harry Mitchell, and we're going to be talking about his very interesting history job and also what history means to him. Let's go and meet him. So we are very fortunate to be joined by my lovely friend, William Harry Mitchell. Now, you may recognise Will because he plays Henry VIII in Monarchs Anonymous, which I'm also in. And he and I met working as historic interpreters. In fact, we did our training for that job together. But we aren't here to talk about that because you've got another super interesting job in history because you are a blue badge guide. And I wonder, for those who are watching who don't know what that is, could you explain what a blue badge guide is, please? Yes. Oh, hi, Kat. Uh, yes. Uh, and um, so a blue badge guide is the sort of the premier standard of guiding in the UK. I think the the guild of guides stems back to the middle of the 1900s, the Festival of Britain. So that was uh, 1951. And there was this great big festival to showcase everything that was Britain. Britain sort of without the empire after the war, Britain coming back on its feet. And there was this huge, huge festival that happened on the South Bank of London, like uh, like almost a Millennium Dome that was built at that point. Um, and all this architecture that's all sadly gone now, um, except for the Festival Hall. And the guides who were brought on to work on that festival, they got together as a guild and they still exist to this day as the Guild of Guiding. Um, there are a number of institutions that you can belong to, um, but essentially the whole thing is to you get trained and you get one of these badges, a blue badge. This is my London blue badge, which shows I've done the, the London course. And I've got my like, lanyard there as well. I've also got this, which I'm so excited about, my Windsor Castle badge, which I that was very like worked very hard to try and get hold of that because I was so expecting we were going to be doing so many Windsor Castle tours uh, last year. But as it turns out, uh, we were not. Um, but yes, that's so that's that's what I am. I have I have this blue badge. I, I've been guiding myself for about six years now maybe actually seven years you can never know what's going on with the pandemic anymore where the years went but um i've been a blue badge now for two two years no no i haven't a year and a half um and uh, <laughs> and and so i'm really i'm raring to get out there and, uh, and actually guide some people as an official blue badge now and do blue badges do they get you as a guide special access into certain places Exactly. Yes, that, that that that's sort of why you go for it. You know, you can you could do a walking tour of London, um, whoever you were, whatever qualifications you have. Getting the blue badge means that you have uh, agreements with certain sites uh, that allow you free access. Uh, such as say the the British Museum or something like that. If you bring a group, you can you can take your group in and just and uh, uh, get in for free. But with certain places uh, like the Tower of London or Westminster Abbey, you cannot guide inside unless you belong to the organisation that runs it. So it's Historical Palaces or Westminster Abbey um, itself, uh, unless you have a blue badge. So the blue badge gets you in there. Um, in fact, at Westminster Abbey, you can also usually skip the queue as well. You can go in through a special secret entrance and you'll miss out on the, um, the the big queue that forms outside the abbey. So there are a lot of advantages with uh, booking at all with a blue badge guide beyond the fact that you just know you're booking with somebody who really knows the area they're guiding in. Yeah, because you do. I mean, I remember when you were going through your train to be a blue badge guide and it is incredibly rigorous. Could you, I, I mean, I know it took years so could you please just give a, a pricey of the sort of thing and how you are examined to get to be a blue badge guide yeah so it's two years work uh, i started at the beginning of 2017 and worked through till the early parts of uh, 2020 um and um throughout that time you know i have done the london course which as i say is, is probably the longest course you do so you learn a huge amount of history about london and london's um 
neighborhoods and, and its, its social scene and things like that. But you also learn everything about Britain as well. So while we were learning, we were being taken on trips to Stonehenge, to the Cotswolds, all the way out to Bath um, and down to Dover Castle and things like that. So we covered a huge, huge area. Um, in those two years, lots of practical site visits, lots and lots of lectures. And the actual examination process involves several written papers about the background uh, to, to, to England in general and the history of England, the history of London, um, and sort of your writing about those out of town places. And then lots and lots of practical exams where you have about 20 stops going around a museum, for example, where you have to stand in front of an object and talk about it for five minutes. Um, and you, and whereas when you're usually leading a tour, you will not have a script. You will be, you're a blue badge guide. You, you will improvise your tour. You know enough that you can talk as you go. With these exams, you need to know a tight five minutes because going over or under was, was uh, bad. We had a couple of practicals in the first year and the second year, I think we had six practical exams so that was something I, I worked this out it's something like uh, six hours I think mean, six hours of uh, of work that you needed to uh, to memorize you know which you think about that that's like three plays worth of material that you have to just be able to pull out depending on where you are and don't get me started on the coach exam because coach exam you are sat on a coach going around London and you'll be called up to the microphone wherever you are and you must just talk about what you can see around you about what that tells you about London how that integrates with other places you've been on that tour and you will get called up about three times and you talk for maybe 15 minutes in total and you just have to talk any pauses any long uh, rests any saying oh I don't know where I am right now that's a lot of trouble so that was a huge amount of background work to know where you are everywhere in central London. And so essentially if you if you can get through that and get awarded your blue badge, then somebody who is coming on a tour with you can be fairly assured that you have practice in disseminating information and also retaining that information and that you have essentially in your training been in quote peer reviewed because if you're so you can't just get away with saying rubbish, can you? Mm, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and that the, that coach exam is where you have the the greatest sort of chance of accidentally because you haven't been you haven't been able to go away and learn so much, and you might just find yourself just like drifting off into some uh, anecdote. Uh, I was always on the edge of that because I because I was the theatre manager for a while, and I always had all these many stories about different celebrities in the theatres it was always a danger of just being like oh this one time I was down the pub and and uh, this guy had a terrible head wound yes and so you have to always sort of bring it back to keep keep things short and don't and don't go uh, crazy but yes you are right um you you know that if you get someone who's qualified as a blue badge they know what they're talking about pretty much anywhere and even if you ask them the question that stumps them which is always good, always good fun to try and, uh, you know, ask a question where your guide won't know the answer. Um, they will know something um, interesting that will be sort of around that topic. Uh, because mm. Who could hold everything in their head? Yeah, I think in, in some ways there's, there's a lot of similar skills between being a blue badge guide and being a historic interpreter. Because if somebody asks you a question and you're in costume and you don't know the particular answer in relation to the character you're portraying, you better be able to answer something that's adjacent so, they, so that it seems like you've answered the question asked. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, with a blue badge guide, you aren't just covering a period of history for one individual who you're portraying. You have to be able to do that across the span of the centuries and it's it's incredibly impressive so the world is now starting to open up mm -hmm. hopefully it won't be too long before the back and flow uh, of tourism and travel is is happening I, i'm sure that you are absolutely gagging for that to be so if and when they are coming over here and they're planning a uk sightseeing trip could you please give them your dream itinerary that you would suggest if you were going to guide them? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I, 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 I cover so many topics. I cover Jane Austen in Hampshire or Jane Austen in Bath or, um, you know, sort of the, the university, so Oxford and Cambridge and things like that. But 
at my heart, I am an absolute geek for castles and knights. I love my medieval history. You know, you know I portray Henry VIII, but Henry VIII is actually starting to get a bit late for me. I like guys in chainmail um, smashing around and hitting each other with war hammers, and things like that. So for me, it's all about medievalism. You would, I would say, you come, in, you fly into London, uh, you stay in London, you see the Tower of London, Westminster Abbey, you have a walking tour of the streets of the old city of London, maybe like find a few of the sort of buried Roman remains that are down there as well. Um, there's so much, so much just history just just from the way that the streets are set up in London the sort of running together of things and the street names that tell you about what was sold on that street um almost a thousand years ago and um yeah so London you've you got to you've got to do London you've got to do the medieval stuff you've got to go to, to Spitalfields and see the 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 Hospitaller Knights uh Grand Gateway into into their priory that's up there so there you go that's that's your London bit and then you're going to get out of London and you're going to go and see some of the amazing castles you go down to Kent and you see maybe Hever Castle where Anne Boleyn grew up or Leeds Castle known as the, the loveliest castle on earth you go down to Dover and you see a real fighting fortress with layers and layers of uh, defences built up over the years. And then maybe you come along the coast, you see Arundel, you see Winchester. What an amazing place Winchester is, the cathedral, the Saxon kings in there. I'm going, I mean, we're getting on and on. Of course you see Stonehenge. Um, and then you get out to, you go to Bath and then maybe you even just dibble over into Wales and see some of the castles out there. And that's a, you know, that's a, a long, long uh, to, oh, and of course, you must see like Warwick Castle and Kenilworth Castle up in uh, the north, and you can see Stratford on Avon and hear about William Shakespeare while you're there. But castles all <laughs> the way. I would, uh, I would say people to I, you know, I've just done a, I've just done a whole week myself up in the very north of the country, um, in Northumberland, uh, seeing the castles of the Percys, uh, the Dukes and Earls. Of, uh, of Northumberland, the Lions of the North, and they have some fantastic castles um, up there to see. Uh, so yes, um, we are lousy with castles, come and see all our castles. I mean that that's you've really whetted my appetite there, and of course the the Northumberlands that there was that apparent old saying the North knows no king but a Percy. Uh, well, who or or when that was first said is anybody's guess. Uh, those that sort of trip that you discussed going from London and down and round and I love the dibbling into Wales, uh, <laughs> the ring of steel of Edward I of the Welsh castles. Yes. How many days would that tour be? Um, so you'd be in London for maybe one or two days. Uh, you'd be in Kent for at least a day, maybe two. There are some, some great, I mean, it's just, so much great countryside to see in uh, in Kent as well. You go to Arundel on your way to Hampshire, um, so maybe you could do Arundel and into Winchester in a day, and then so it's, well, we're up to at least three days now. No, four days. Then uh, a day Stonehenge and uh, and up into the Cotswolds. So, oh, we're getting onto a week. We're talking about a week here. You can maybe you can maybe fit all of that into a week. It'd be quite a busy week. Um, you might want a bit of uh, time, but. Uh, Yes, uh, there's always, there's so many beautiful hotels and pubs in the countryside where you could stay and you could spend a day just pottering around the local villages uh, as well. So you make that a nice long fortnight uh, and have a really beautiful time uh, in in England, in the South. Yeah, that, sound, that does sound absolutely beautiful. And of course, um, you frequently, when it's out of London, you will drive people around, won't you? So I they do. haven't got to worry about getting there um, because some things can be slightly hard to navigate uh, if you're not au fait with the back roads of the British countryside. So it's always good to have a blue badge guide who can also drive, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's great. I am a, I'm a driver guide. I'm part of the Driver Guide Association. Um, which means I have a, a whole extra heap of licenses to make sure I'm uh, you know, legally allowed to to drive small groups around in my uh, my people carrier. So you can everybody can be covered off. All they've got to do is pack their own lunch. That's it. <laughs> oh, no, oh, oh, we will find you pubs everywhere. There are great places for for lunch all over the English countryside. So oh, so it's, it's worry so about so that. It'll be a food tour as well. So oh, they, yeah. you can drive them, you can suggest the places, but also they can make a you can make a bespoke tour based on their interests, can't you? Mm -hmm. um, you'll drive them there, you'll find them a place to eat, 
can you uh, suggest places to sleep as well? Can you basically plan their holiday for them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with a, with a bit of help here and there, yes. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, that sounds like a, a, a perfect plan. And, it, and in fact, I will, of course, be leaving all of Will's contact details and his booking info in my description box. So when people do come over to the UK, you can be their first port of call. You were talking about castles. In my last video on Friday, we talked about various news headlines, and I'm sure that you saw um, that there's been a theft from Arundel. I know that you have a whole tour of Arundel Castle that you do, that you are very au fait with the location. I know you've spoken to me about taking people to go and see Mary Queen of Scots rosary beads. And, and I think I remember you saying that they sometimes used to move about. Uh, well, no, I, there's, there's a huge amount of movement, say, in the cases in, in Windsor Castle. You can never find... They were always looking for the bullet that killed Nelson uh, in Windsor. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, the beads are usually in, uh, in the, one, the one case, and that's why there's just all this wonderful memorabilia um, that was to do with um, the sort of Catholicism in England throughout the period where it, it wasn't um, uh, wasn't allowed by law um, or what was sort of denied from uh, uh, being a part of the offices of high state because the um, I'm sure you know this as well the Howards who who have uh, the, the Dukes of Norfolk who hold Arundel Castle they are um, they are a, a family who stayed Catholic all the way through um, the time in England where it was not uh, allowed for people to practice mass uh, and, as I say, to hold offices. Uh, they couldn't, even though they were lords, they couldn't sit in the House of Lords because they were excluded um, uh, by the Act of Settlement, um, which, which some legislation that comes in there later. But they had um, held in their castle, as you say, the, the, the rosary beads that Mary Queen of Scots had uh, had supposedly held on her way to her execution and given to her um, by the Howards, I think. And uh, one of the Howards had had been due to marry her, or he had proposed marriage to Mary Queen of Scots, and he had been executed for that as well by Queen Elizabeth. So there's, you know, they're very linked uh, to the uh, to Mary Queen of Scots as a family, and they had the pen that George IV used to sign the act of Catholic emancipation. So the, the, the changing of that, the allowing of Catholics back into, um, into the, the halls of power, back into um, the government. Uh, and so that was a, an amazing artifact. And I haven't yet seen whether that has gone as well, because, I mean, the, the, I, was, I was due to do a tour this week um, of Arundel, and I sold that on the basis of it being the home of one of the the, the remaining Catholic um, ro uh, noble families mm. that has uh, survived through to this this point. Um, yeah, I mean that that kind of that part of our history and and the presence of those uh, crypto Catholics and and public Catholics who refused to convert, despite the fact that it, it made their life difficult and dangerous. Those are, those are really important artefacts in our history. And we, we don't know whether those beads were carried by Mary Queen of Scots on that fateful day. We don't know that, but that is what's the story that has been attached to them. And, and the loss, the loss is a great, is a very great one. Um, how, until they are reclaimed, uh, and I suppose that's what we're, we're we're both hoping is going to happen. Going forward in guiding, what what are you going to? How are you going to approach that? Well, there will, you know, there, there will always be a story of uh, you know thefts and, uh, and 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 attempted damage. I mean, I have stories that you you tell in the um, in the National Gallery where a suffragist. A suffragette even uh, attacked a painting, and you can still see the scars where uh, she she hacked at this amazing um, work of art with a with a um, 
a cleaver, I believe. Um, and then we have stories of you know, attempts of stealing the crown jewels. We have this uh, story from only a couple of years ago where somebody attempted to steal the Magna Carta from Salisbury Cathedral, and they still have the pane of glass, of safety glass that was over it at the time that is damaged uh, by the attempted uh, theft. That's now to one side and sort of, uh, you know, it's now an artifact in itself, like showing the importance of Magna Carta and how it's still so uh, prevalent in our minds to this day. So whether the beads are found and, and put back or whether they are they are an empty space, a missing like a like a, a missing tooth uh, in the mouth of the castle. Um, they will always be there. They will always be part of the, the story of, of Catholic England. And there's so much there at Arundel, so many amazing portraits and things that will tell you the story of the Howards uh, through the centuries. And now uh, that's just you know, one, one piece of the puzzle that maybe we won't see again, but please, oh, I just hope that it, it, they come back you know, at some mm -hmm. point. I, I love that um, image of them being the missing tooth. That's that there's, there's a space left in, in English history. I, I mean, I think, my best case scenario is that this was perpetrated by people who knew what they were doing and who have a buyer in mind, which might sound peculiar. But my reason for saying that is that if that is the case, then they will enter into a collector's estate at some point, because that is the way of being a human being, that collector will pass away mm -hmm. and somebody will dig into their estate. And those beads will then be found, whether they're in a lockbox at a bank or under your mattress or whatever. That's how those things come back into the collection. My worst case scenario is that it was a smash and grab by a bunch of chancers who don't know what they're doing, who then can't find a buyer. These things are incredibly recognisable. All they could possibly do is melt them down. That is for me. What What do you think? I, I mean, I think I think you're very right there. I think that's probably the the, the the getting them back from somebody else's private collection um yeah it's probably our best way of seeing them again in public um and gosh yeah if uh if they have been melted down by now because you know i, I followed it quite closely and you know they they drove to another town or at least as far as i know like they drove to another town and they burnt that burnt out a vehicle you know a couple of towns away so that to me speaks of people who knew what they were doing they knew to to have their getaway vehicle and then to burn it completely to the ground and then and then move on. That's your as your classic sort of uh, heist movie way of not getting uh, tracked down. So, yeah, I mean, I think they were probably you know it was a robbery to order. Um, yeah, and in that as well, there's a limited number of people who would have the sort of money and the known interest that they would go to the lengths to have the Mary Queen of Scots. And we're assuming that's that the, that was the focus because of all those cups also went. We're assuming the rosary is the focus because it's the focus for us. Yes. Um, but one would imagine that people who are prepared to do this exist on somebody's radar, right? Exactly, exactly. Well, let's so Let's see how it all plays out. Could be fascinating, couldn't it? And, and like you say, the, the cups as well, the cups of the Earl Marshal, you know, that office of being the Earl Marshal, that takes us all the way back to William Marshall, who was this phenomenal figure. I mean, I don't think, I don't think there are cups that stretch back to him, but the, the office stretches back to him. He was so uh, important in, uh, in our history uh, throughout the sort of 11 and 1200s, this figure who spanned the reign of many, many kings and held the country at certain times. And then that office became hereditary and passed down through the family, even though the name changed down the years um, and is still with us. The, 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 the current Duke of, uh, of Norfolk is the Earl Marshal, even though he's a Duke and an Earl, um, and he still organises all the, the, the royal ceremonies to this day. Um, so losing, you know, these 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 artefacts or, you know, of any historical importance is, is such a sad uh, blow mm. to us. Yeah, because even though they were in a Duke's private collection, 
they're on display for the nation, for the for the for the good of the nation, for the enjoyment of the nation, and and all who choose to visit here and and partake in looking on them, um, locking them away, hiding them away is is always a tragedy. I mean, but equally, that is currently the best case scenario that they are still intact. Um, thank you for sharing your your thoughts on on Arundel. And I really love that idea about the missing tooth. I, I do want to go more into your relationship with history before we end, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, and we also have been in rehearsals for Monarchs Anonymous. And uh, I will be releasing a video when we've when the second round of rehearsals have happened. I'm going to put together something so people can see what we've been getting up to in a COVID safe way in a rehearsal room, which was such a joy. But as part of that, I have already asked you these questions, but now you're not in Henry mode. Mm. You are in William Harry Mitchell tour guide mode, blue badge extraordinaire. So what does the blue badge guide in you, what first sparked his interest in history? Um, so <laughs> it's still the same. Uh, I, when I was, when I was uh, very little, um, <laughs> my, my mother decided, because my father had been in the army, no, my grandfather, sorry, had been in the army, that we were not allowed guns to play with. There was no, it was no playing with guns. So I played with swords as a little boy. So again, knights uh, started to come into my mind. I loved any medieval uh, films, especially uh, Errol Flynn's Robin Hood. And when I was asked as like a six-year-old what I was going to be when I grew up, I said, Robin Hood uh, and um, eventually it was explained to me I couldn't be Robin Hood I said well Errol Flynn is Robin Hood and Errol Flynn Errol Flynn William is an actor well I will be an actor then um, but and while I've, while I've continued to pursue acting it really I think at the, the core of it was my love of history that drew me to those to love all those historical films and roles um, and so the the sort of the two jobs that uh, have been like my my biggest um, uh, like parts of my life uh, for the last couple of years have been historical interpretation, playing historical characters, like portraying them in the historical settings, which was like everything coming together. And then also trying as a, as a tour guide, trying to sort of just to to feed that part of other people and myself that you know, yearn to understand history better um, and uh, and just to know more about it. Like I'm always reading new stuff about history and, and learning about new sites uh, to guide uh, people around. Um, and it's so important to have people come and ask questions you've not heard before. And then, you know, that just sort of leads you down new rabbit holes. You're like, oh, that is interesting. That's a really interesting connection you've just come up with. You've put together in your head. I'm going to really read into that and explore um, that theory of history. Oh, just love it. Love being a tour guide. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can totally understand why. Um, put you on the spot on this one. You were talking about new sites. Is there one, is there a site that you haven't guided at yet? that you are gagging to guide at or, or one that um, is coming up that hasn't even opened yet? Like what's, what's a new site that you, that you want to take people to or learn more about? So something that I've done uh, since getting the blue badge guy, getting the blue badge um, and in the gaps between lockdowns is I've, made, I've been trying to visit all the graves of uh, the wives of Henry VIII. Um, so several of them are here in London. They were quite easy to visit. I went to Peterborough Cathedral to see um, Catherine of Aragon's uh, grave, and then of course Jane Seymour. Oh, sorry, I always say of course when I'm talking. When I'm getting really into history. It's such a such a naughty thing for a guide to say because you never assume that people. And of course, but I'm I'm, I'm talking to you, Cat, as a as a historian. Of course, you know <laughs> Jane Seymour is buried with with Henry at Windsor Castle, but I've never been to Sudley Castle where Catherine Parr, Henry VIII's sixth wife, is buried. It's, it's way over in the western part of the Cotswolds. Um, I've been around that area so many times. I've, I've sort of suggested it as a tour 
uh, to people and sort of whilst very, very sweaty in the Cotswolds being like, oh, I'd, I'd really like to go there, but I've never been. So that's going to be a really awkward tour. Um, but uh, yes, I, but I really need to get out there and have a look at uh, that site so that maybe I can then offer a Wives of Henry VIII resting places tour, which I think would be, a, again, another lovely week. Oh, absolutely. That would be delightful and I have never been to Sudley either and in in my youth Anne Boleyn was my wife of choice but I have to say the older I get the more of an affinity I feel with Catherine Parr and I I, she's fast becoming my favorite actually so if you are doing a recce of Sudley do let me know um, and we can we can also for your future guests that you're taking around we can buggy check it. We'll we'll yeah. bung the baby in the back of the car and we'll go we'll go find out about Sudley. That's that's yeah. amazing. Well, that's a deal, I think. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, for me, for me though, it's it. I think I think Catherine of Aragon is probably my favourite wife because she never gave in. She always hung on to uh, you know, her rights right to the end, and I think that's is phenomenal. She they were together for so long. And then she just said no. <laughs> like when she was told, Madam, you must step aside. No. <laughs> okay. um, so, I mean, it's, it's, she's a formidable woman. Absolutely. There's, and of course, there's, there's something to admire in all of them. Even, and people, if, if people like Anne, they tend to despise Jane. Mm. But I think that all of these women, in their various ways, shaped the Tudor world mm-hmm. as surely as Henry VIII did. Mm-hmm. We always hear about Elizabeth as Henry VIII's daughter, but she's as much Catherine Parr's daughter yeah. and Anne Boleyn's daughter and Cat Ashley's daughter and all of these people that created this woman and instilled the hopes the fears, the strength, all of these people. Um, and equally, because of her run-ins with Mary, her half-sister, she is also shaped by Cath Varrigan. All of the lives of these women made the Elizabeth that we look back on as being this golden age. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Resting Places of Henry's Wives would be a phenomenal tour, particularly because it in London, it's two massive heavy hitters of the Tower and Westminster and there's as well as them there's so much other stuff to see like it's a I think it's a great way to wind your way across the country really nice and of course we've proved that you can't talk about you can't even mention Henry VIII without having to talk about all of the six wives um because that's something we know from interpretation that you will always if you're playing Henry VIII you must at some point talk about all of the wives (laughs) which do you know what I wonder though if that's changed Mm. Uh, I I wonder if, because there is more of a drive now within history to make them into distinct figures, more Mm. than the rhyme and more than the cookie cutter image of them, that actually when you get somebody who's playing Henry, it's like, okay, I know who you are. Tell me about the women. (laughs) What do you think of the women? Because we we, we know Bluff King Howe, and we also know the cantankerous frankly tyrannical beast that he becomes it's interesting that that becomes the question because I I do wonder if that's our experience because history is shifting in its interpretations we we don't know because we're interpreting 20 years ago (laughs) we're old but they're not we're not that old (laughs) um I do of course have now one more question and it's links in many ways to the way in which history is being told. And it's it's that big one of why does history matter? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you, you've asked me this before. Um, and, you and you didn't like it then either. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I was talking to somebody just last night and I was saying to them that, because they were getting very upset about the state of the world today and climate change and you know, all the sort of uh, politics that's going on, which um, they, they particularly were not very happy with. And, um, and I was saying that it is interesting, though, because as you dig back into history, 
There's so many times in our history, and I'm, please don't, I'm not trying to minimize climate change or anything here, but there's so many times in our history where civilizations have thought the world was coming to an end. And sometimes they were absolutely right. But, you know, the, um, we, we, in recent times, you know, had, a, had a, a sneaking suspicion that maybe 2012 was, because it was the end of the Mayan calendar, maybe the world was going to come to an end. And people actually, you know, genuinely got very upset about that. We really thought the millennium was going to be this huge crashing of all of our technology um, and that the, the world would just sort of fall off a cliff there. You go back to you know, the year 1000, year 500, people thought the end was coming 100%, repent, repent. Um, the, you know the people in Europe at least and and we have all these examples and and there have been times that whole civilizations have crashed uh to the floor but the world rebuilds and I, I know there's no planet too I know that climate change really might be absolutely the end of the road but I think if you're of a, of a nervous disposition I think it's quite interesting to know that this has happened before and this will happen again and we as a species must sort of understand that you know what we think is so important right now in in um you know, 100 years time will it will just be a footnote in in some history books um and uh, and so i think you know i i i i saw your your interview with lauren um the other week and you you were talking about how um we 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 are the same if you, if you look really, if you get really, really intensely into the life of someone in Tudor England, a lot of their hopes and dreams would be very similar to ours now. And, uh, and you'll see how similar humans have been over the centuries. Um, but, you know, we, uh, we, we have to, we do need to, to understand the history, maybe not to make the same mistakes, but also just to like, to calm down a little bit and know that you don't have to go absolutely bonkers crazy with whether we're right wing or left wing right now. We need to sort of be a bit calmer and uh, and know that this this has happened before and it will happen again. And I think you only know that if you study history or if you read about it. Or indeed, if you watch the new season of the new series of Battlestar Galactica, the remix, where it's uh, <laughs> All this happened before, and all this happened. It will happen again, and and there is there is a, there is that's where it's from. <laughs> <laughs> so profound. So I know, profound. but it's, do you know what? I always quote Cersei because in the Game of Thrones, you win or you die, yes. and BSG. Absolutely, all this has happened before, and all this will happen again, and 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 that includes the millenarian fears about a world-ending catastrophe. And yeah, there are real and present threats that should be absolutely taken seriously. And they can be. Um, but we are not the first people to feel like we are at the end of days. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a common sensation that has been experienced by our ancestors and our ancestors have talked about it. I mean, whether it's seeing um, Halley's Comet in 1066 or the Black Death mm. or the World Wars, well, you know, the Great War, World War I, World War II, those were times where it, it quite rightly felt like the world was ending. Mm -hmm but it didn't and human beings do find a way usually when they're back is it that's what history teaches me is that human beings will find a way when their back is against the wall to rebuild because we are social creatures i think sometimes with the way in which we are frequently positioned against each other by sources and forces outside of ourselves saying no more that we are being led to forget that there is more that connects us than divides us um and history teaches us that it doesn't always tend to be the people with all the wealth power and position that have everybody else's best interests at heart 
that's <laughs> that's what history teaches me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do. I think that's really nice that that history can be a way for the supremely anxious like myself to find some solace. I mean, granted, there are some awful things that happen in history, but the perseverance of the human spirit mm. is something that's clear throughout. And I like that. Yeah. Before I let you go, is there anything that you would like to say, plug, any final thoughts? Please come back. We're, we're very nice over here. Soon as you can, let's all, let's all take trips around our shared heritage uh, here in England. Yes, well, that's yes. Please come, come visit as soon as it's as soon as it's safe, uh, and look after, help us look after our institutions with us by by supporting them too. Um, well, thank you. It's it's always a pleasure, Will, to have a chat with you, and uh, I hope it will not be very long before we are sat in a break room together again, or perhaps uh, on a road trip to go and see a royal grave. Um, but yeah, I hope you have a lovely rest of the day and I will see you soon. You later, Kat. Bye. Bye. But what do you think of everything that Will and I have been discussing today? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section and hopefully we'll be able to drop in and answer any relevant questions. You can also find both he and I on our various social media that I will be leaving linked in the description as well. If you follow us there, we can continue the conversation there too. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then why not share it with some friends? Why not let me also know that you liked it by hitting the thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel. And if you think you are subscribed, now is a great time just to check to make sure that YouTube hasn't unsubscribed you without you knowing. While you're there, checking, subscribing, and resubscribing, maybe, why not also hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.